first read the gospel for today, I thought it was quite reassuring because although you might have missed the opening verses, Jesus and his friends went to church, as it were, and that's what they say. Not church exactly, but the synagogue in Capernaum on the northern sea of Galilee. But like us, coming to church on sun, because it's Sunday, on Sunday because it's Sunday. And that's how the reading that we had this morning opened. It seems a bit like us, those who were gathered in the forecourt of the synagogue enjoyed a bit of teaching that they could relate to, something that caught their imagination and seemed to come with authority, and they could hang on to it and say, yes, yes. They seemed to be exciting that, enjoying that and being excited by it, because Jesus taught them in that forecourt of the synagogue as one having authority, and not as, the reading says, not as one of the scribes. And I don't know about you, but it's always great when you listen to someone who knows what they're talking about, someone that you can follow what they're saying, someone whose ideas resonate with something you've been thinking about. And so here we have it, Mark's Gospel. The first of the written narrative gospels, the first continuous story, the foundational text, if you will, that the other gospel writers make good use of when they record their versions of the story of Jesus of Nazareth. And it begins in the forecourt of the synagogue. And here we have him, Jesus of Nazareth, son of Mary and Joseph the carpenter, cousin of John the baptizer, gathered there teaching with authority. Remember, Mark's writing about 70 in the common era, and it was a ghastly time for Jewish people who had a few years earlier revolted against the Roman rule and were now paying the consequences as the Roman legions reconquered Jerusalem. Mark is looking back and offering reassurance to the emerging Christian community that Jesus really was someone in whose story they can have confidence. Someone who was linked with their Jewish hopes and expectations. A prophet raised up from among themselves, as Deuteronomy says. And in this season of Epiphany, we consider what we know about Jesus. We consider is there anything else we can discover about this man that will add to his significance in our time for us as a prophet of wisdom, a godding person, someone who enacts God, a justice seeker, a healer? It's the time in the calendar when we wonder what new insights we can glimpse into this person who it seems still has the capacity to influence our lives over 2,000 years after he lived, albeit in very different times from our own. Who was this man? And why are we still coming to church and talking about him? Well, he's an artisan's son, raised in Nazareth, a follower of his cousin John the Baptizer, who, people, who called people to repent for the structural wrongs of their age, Remember I just mentioned they were, had been living under Roman rule and were again. And who calls them back to the fundamental values of their covenant with God. And John calls them to remember who they are as a people. As the story goes, John was baptized by his cousin John in the River Jordan. And in this event, was identified as a person with even more power and authority to bring about change than John himself. And it goes on to say that God's voice was heard and heard to declare, you are my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. Again, echoing the first testament, Isaiah this time. And then Jesus, as we know, goes off into the wilderness from where John came. And 40 days later, John is arrested by Herod, Herod Antipas, son of Herod the Great, ruler of Galilee, 
beheaded and thereby triggering the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. Jesus emerges and invites four fishermen to follow him and they head to Capernaum. Then, because it's the Sabbath, off they go to the synagogue and we pick up the story today there. Right here at the outset of the story, Jesus engages the public with his take on the issues of the day, on the, on the situations that would, be, that would mark his ongoing ministry. We find him confronting unclean spirits, or perhaps we could phrase it, denouncing evil and proclaiming in words and actions the good news of the kingdom of God. We don't know for sure what Jesus taught in this first event at the interface of religious and political authorities in the forecourt of the synagogue, but we can imagine. Mark describes for us, in symbolic terms, the instance Jesus engages authoritatively with the systems that cause illness, social breakdown, and collusion in injustice right then, right at the outset, right there in the forecourt of the synagogue, his first public act. There was something in Jesus' teaching in this first public encounter that enabled the people to understand what he, Jesus, was about. We're told he called an unclean spirit out of a man. And in this instance, Jesus embodies resistance to the demonic, resistance to evil, resistance to all that dehumanizes, isolates, marginalizes. It is no wonder the people gathered around were excited, no wonder they were intrigued and a bit puzzled, and perhaps even a bit afraid. Have you come to destroy us, the man asks. Jesus might well have answered yes. But he says, come out, come out of him. We know today, as the people who were Mark's audience knew, stories such as this were not literally about the healing of one demon-possessed man. That would not have been noteworthy anyway. There were lots of accredited healers casting out demons in those days, and Jesus was unlikely to have been one of them. He'd just come out of the wilderness. No wonder they started talking about him. His fame began to spread, despite Jesus trying to command silence. Exorcism was a concern for the early church. It was not rare. As Walter Wink, theologian and writer on spirituality and politics, says, it was the indispensable prerequisite for getting a new mind, cleansing the mind of misinformation that enslaves people. As Amanda spoke of last week, it was about creating the opportunity for metanoia, We too often need to clear our mind, to create the circumstances where we can see something from a different point of view. Perhaps that is one of the reasons we're still cogitating on the stories and insights about Jesus that have developed over the millennia. And we can so easily put ourselves in the story. We could be harboring an unclean spirit though in these days we don't usually speak about confusion and misapprehension that way. Unlike the people of Jesus' day, many of whom readily accepted the presence of evil, demonic forces inhabiting people in mainstream theology, we just don't, and we don't personalize evil this way. We don't tend to understand evil as an entity that inhabits us. Although exorcism to cast out an evil spirit is still practiced in some threads of Christianity today, 
Even so, it's rare. It's more likely that we will speak about behaviours as evil, as wrong, as crimes against humanity. And most of us can think of some behaviours and actions, usually on a global or national scale, that we would want to label this way. When, we, when these behaviours, especially from a significant power base, coalesce, they become systems that need to be transformed. We can name a number of places in our world today where we could name such behaviours. Think Gaza, Israel, Ukraine, Russia. Mega wealth accumulation at the expense of the planet, for example. Think of those examples, and you probably can think of others. But bring the metaphor closer to home, to our personal, interpersonal, and community arenas, then most of us find ourselves silent colluders in the status quo, which holds in place systems of racism, homophobia, sexism, hunger, homelessness, and other markers of a society that is still far from materialising the kingdom or kingdom of God. Think carefully. You know them. Jesus calls these unclean spirits out. They come out, but not without protest. Many of us are possessed by selfish greed, avarice, personal aggrandizement, a sense of superiority or entitlement, and most of us don't give them up without a fuss, without protest either. For to give them up will require a change in our life priorities. I wonder if this story can help us to see this and to own it? Will it encourage us to repent, to turn again toward the vision of the kingdom of God that Jesus was proclaiming and struggling for? Will it encourage us to begin to live as though it were here, now? We might well be afraid. The changes required will be significant if we are to give up the dehumanizing systems that hold us enthralled and often make life good for us, but not so good for others, and indeed precarious for future generations. But the story of God's good news and the example of Jesus reassures us that we don't do it alone. We're called to work together to make the changes necessary to work with the spirit of God that is found in the positive creative energy for justice found among us, around us, within us. When we work together for good, for justice, we incarnate God. Or to use the words of Carter Haywood, a feminist theologian, to the extent our relationships encourage one another to be ourselves as fully, productively, and joyfully as possible, we are generating more mutuality, and it is good. We are Godding. The spirits and attitudes that hold us back are called out. We're called to clear our mind and to help others clear their minds too. We can do this for each other, not by being silent when we see or hear damaging behaviours or attitudes, nor by being silent when we encounter systems that dehumanise, marginalise, or tend to make people and groups of people invisible, nor being silent when we are confronted by decisions that endanger the health of the planet that supports our life. We need to speak up and call them out. So I think it's stories like this one, strange though it might seem on first reading, that calls us back to the task 
of working with God. And it's working with God that keeps us exploring the significance of Jesus. We have caught a vision of how the world could be. We want to be part of it. We want our vision to become a reality. So no matter what our particular framework or how firm our faith is, or how many questions we have, it's the vision that emerges from the Gospels and the opportunity to wonder at it and to explore in the company of others how to bring it to realization that keeps us coming to church. There is much work to be done if the hungry are to be fed, the homeless housed, the imprisoned set free, the thirsty given water, and those living with violence shown there can be peace with justice and love, there is much work to be done if we are all to live with compassion and kindness, if we're to live in an earth that is flourishing. <laughs>